you know, honestly, <laughs> I really want a writing team. <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> Come on now. Oh, no. Okay. Hey. Oh, yeah. hey. No, we'll yeah. talk. We'll talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad this happened. Yes. I'm so glad this happened. No. <laughs> yeah. But no, that was, that was, Look, that was amazing. That was, I could talk at all. Oh my God. No, seriously, yeah. that was so good. Thank you so much. Like, this was Okay, so I just talked about something. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. It's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Getting towards the end of the school year is really helping because uh, it's about time to go. Yeah, yeah, so you go to DePaul. I go to DePaul. Yeah. Yeah, I'm an acting major there. Okay. Um, yeah. That's so cool. And so, yeah, can I ask? We can start off there because I know I'm stressed as fuck. Yeah. Uh, being a artist right now, yeah. real pandemic. Yeah. And being in school. Yeah. Like, how do you juggle? Plus, having a production company. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've had some really bad days. I've had some okay days, and I've had some good days. I feel like this pandemic, like it sucks ass, but it it actually came at a good point in my life, cause. You know, being isolated, being alone, I feel like you have no choice but to be with yourself. I spent a lot of time trying to do my own art, but also trying to still be in school. And I was finding it was like, something felt like it was fighting itself. And I was like, what is going on? Like, why do I not feel like I can make art and still be in school anymore? And I really realized, I was like, well, school's not really happening right now. This is really just virtual. Everyone's kind of like, yeah, if you can get it in, please try to get this assignment in. And I was just thinking to myself, like, if, you know, the universe can really just kind of stop the norm like that and, you know, stop your routine of going to school every day, having these assignments, doing rehearsals after hours, you know, really in that void, I, feel, I felt like my art was trying to fulfill that void for like, four weeks I turned my bathroom into like a little art studio and just like painted and, and, and made clay things and, and it was just one of those moments where it was like I actually had the time and the freedom to do art without anyone's you know feedback or guidance or like their limitations and you know that's something that I felt heavily being in this institution was that it was like, we want you to be an artist and a very open and well-rounded artist, but you have to do our kind of art. And that's where I was like, I'm, I'm now in a place where I'm, I'm being forced to kind of find out who I am as an artist, but who I am as a human being as well. Mm -hmm. And to be a part of an institution that still wants to hold me back in some sort of way, it was like, I felt like a, a, an animal in a cage. It was just like, can you please let me out? And then the production company, you know, that also came in the same period where I was figuring out what I was as an artist, you know, uh, there was one day where, it, you know, just with everything of like work and school, it was like, well, this is not what I want to rely on for the rest of my life. Um, so I made that decision. I said, well, you know what? I, I think it's about time that I start a production company, um, secure my LLC, things like that. COVID-19 has showed me that the world can flip on a dime like that. Mm -hmm. um, and not to say like I want security or I want to be comfortable, but I at least want to be in a position where I'm not relying on other people to get somewhere in life. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole thing about these institutions, I feel like it was promoted that this is what you have to do in order to get here. But there weren't really other options, they weren't saying any other things to like let you know that you can still be an artist and go that 30,000 different paths. Let's talk about... Um your production company. Yeah. So you want to just talk about it, like how it, you felt, found yeah. it? Yeah. So I, I was sitting in my room. <laughs> and I, was, I was like, what am I going to do with my life? You know? And there's always this pressure of that once you get out of college, you got to book an agent, you got to be booking roles, yada, yada, yada. And so I just remember I was sitting in my room and I'm like, well, if I can make my bathroom into a little art studio and do whatever I want, then why can I not take advocacy for what I want to do after this? At first, you know, I thought of a theater company, you know, and then I said, well, oh, theater's not happening right now. You, <laughs> you can do so much more than a theater company. Right. And so that's when I was like, oh, a production company. In February, 
really before uh, COVID really started to come to the U.S., uh, I had just done a um, an album release party. And after that, I was like, oh, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. I was like, ooh, managing artists and like also getting footage and content for like their brand. Like, mm -hmm. I love that. As much as I love being on camera and being in front of the camera, I really love uh, coordinating everything. Yeah. You know, I love making sure that you know, you got your team, you got your artists, you got your creative team. And so what I decided about, so the name, my name of the production company is Goodman and Poea. I have a great, great uncle. His name is Lester Goodman. So he was born, I think it was 1915. He was a dancer for all of his life. Um, he opened the Joseph Holmes Dance Company here in Chicago. He's opened for, uh, I, I believe it was for Ella Fitzgerald one one day Shut um, up. and and the story is that when he opened for Ella Fitzgerald um, she got upset because he got a standing ovation and she was like yeah he can't open for me again and so you know he's always been like I wouldn't even say he's like like been my mentor mm -hmm. but in a way he's kind of been like my angel even like while he was here on earth because it was just it was the only representation of art that I really saw in my family Hearing his stories of like where he started to seeing him being a hundred and still doing art, I think for me, it was like, oh no, you know, our artist is not just, it's not like a hobby, you know, it's a way of life. And so, you know, the name Goodman comes from him. Um, and then Poea, one of our, I think it's like my fourth great grandfather, he's Native American and his name is Poea. So I put together Goodman and Poea, put two good energies together, and uh, started a production company. What we're hoping is that we do a full launch summer of 2021. Right now, I'm working with a artist, Kimon Shook, on a 10-minute uh, short. Uh, it's for the HBO uh, Asian Directors competition. After that, well, currently, I'm also working on a feature film uh, by two artists named Jasmine Rush and Ashley Funches. Uh, the project's called A Yellow Circus. So we're really looking forward for that. Um, but then the goal is to, once graduation is over, once I get maybe like a month to breathe, you know, we launch and then we're good to go. Now that you're creating space for other creatives, mm -hmm. do you feel like comfortable to put your own work on that platform? It's interesting you say that because um, the first project that I started underneath the production company, or the first project that I did is a dance short film to Nina Simone's Lilac Wine. Um, and I have this phenomenal dancer, her name is Imani Monet. You know, we shot that in September and it's still in post-production right now. And it's interesting because Gary and I actually had a conversation and we were like, and I told him, I was like, hey, you know, let me know if this is like consuming your time. You know, I want to be respectful. And, and I just know that this has been happening since September. And we had this conversation and, and we came to the same uh, place of, you know, some projects take their time. There was a part of me where I felt like, but dang, this is my project. Shouldn't my project be out before everybody else's project I do? I have been in situations where I felt like my artistry is either rushed or on a time limit. Mm. And I find that I don't like that. <laughs> I, you know, I find I, I, I found that um, you know when I'm being kind of uh, constrained in terms of art, it just it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I either I get very closed in, mm -hmm. or I just go, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, there, I think there was a moment where I definitely was like, how am I going to do my own work right now? You know, actually, I have a, a family friend who's a, a producer and an agent. And I, I was talking with her one day and I said, hey, I really want to write the script for you. I want you, you know, offer you executive producer. I told her, I was like, once I get the script done, I'll send it to you. I haven't gotten that script done. However, I've had other projects offered to me that I presented to her. You know, that was another moment of, I'm not doing what I want to do for my own work that I'm creating myself. But I, you know, there, I, I have this feeling that my time will come. You know, honestly, <laughs> I really want a writing team. <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> Come on now. No, no. Okay. Oh, hey. No, we'll talk. We'll talk. I'm so glad this happened. Yes. I'm so glad this happened. No, Literally, because I'm sitting there, I know I'm not the best writer. Mm -hmm. I can talk about things. Also, my ADHD is like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with it, you know? And so it's like, 
Um, one, you know, one of my best friends, Kimon and Bear, they just wrote a pilot for a TV series called Planets, and um, hearing how they, you know, they met, they wrote these things out. You know, I was looking at them, was like. Well, you guys want to write this? It's like, you know, and so, you know, moments like that, I, I really, I tell myself, I try not to pressure myself because I feel like I get that from the world regardless. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, I just, in terms of like doing my own projects, I take my time because I'm also like an OCD perfectionist. I really want to make sure that if it's done, it's done kind of the way that I wanted to do that. So while I was at DePaul, my freshman year, my acting class had the largest amount of black actors that the theater school has ever had, which was 11. Um, so not right, not that big of a number, but uh, I guess it was big for them. And so what we did probably like four months into our freshman year was we started a student organization uh, known as Black Artists of Today. And this was just, honestly, it was a space where black artists could come, devise work, chat, gossip, plan activities, events, things like that. Uh, as time transpired, I became the president of that organization. I think that's probably where it really started, this terms of creating space for other artists, because what I've realized, what I've come to realize, is that I'm a lot more privileged than a lot of my black friends that I'm around. Um, being a light-skinned, uh, upper middle class, black American, queer black American. Um, you know, I have walked this life pretty privileged, you know? Not to say that I want to be like someone's savior, but I want to be a service. Because I feel like I've grown up and seen a lot of people who either look like me, come from similar family structures or households, and not been able to get the opportunities that, that I've had. I have a question yeah. for you. How do you want the com the community to receive your art? Like, what do you want them to do? Mm, yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't say I've thought about that in depth, but there was a moment, I think it was Lena Waith, and they were talking about Queen and Slim. And they were saying how, you know, they were getting a lot of feedback and negative or negative feedback about the movie and how that just didn't represent black people, mm. you know, to its fullest and things like that. And it gets me thinking because it's easy for me to get anxious about a project and go, oh, no one's going to like it. Uh, you know, it's only going to get this many likes, this many views, you know. So, so like one of the biggest issues that I have, and I think this kind of goes into, you know, what is the standard of art is that art has been become very capitalistic. Who am I creating art for? You know, because I want my art to be universal. I want everyone to be able to go, oh, I either see a piece of myself or I see um, a part of something in that. Um, but I never want to get into the habit of like single storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want it to be like, this is only who this person is. This is only what this story is about. You know, I want everything. I want everyone to be able to get a piece of the pie. There is a, that issue with capitalism and art, where it feels like, oh well, I can pay this much money to be here, so that's why I, I'm here. Yeah. Well, I was like, well, that wasn't really for you. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it, at the same time, art is for everyone. However, I'm more concerned about the people who don't have these access or don't have the access to these things. So it's accessibility. Yeah, it's, it truly is yeah. about accessibility. And this kind of goes back to, you know, earlier about community engagement. It's mm -hmm. like, and I can't talk about like how uh, blessed I have been with like the opportunity, like I'm here. Like I'm, I can't tell you how blessed I've been to have the life that I have. Mm -hmm. And I just know that it is different for a lot of other people. You know, one of my family friends, she's a, a dean of a school, and I, she was on the phone with my mom, and I just hopped in, and I said, you know, what's the thing that your kids need the most art-wise? And she was like, everything, because they're getting nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dang, when I was in middle school, grammar school, we at least had a recorder, mm -hmm. you know? We, we did whatever with that. I remember we were talking about this. Yeah. When we did our consultation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's so important. Yeah. Our education is so important. It is. And, you know, it's it's not to say, like, you, you know, it's that common trope of, oh, they, they'll fund the sports teams, but they won't fund the arts. But that's kind of what it is, you know. Yes.
You know, I, I like to think that everything is a form of art. In every movement, there is art. Um, there's rhythm in everything. And so, you know, I think about like construction workers, but like buildings outside, like buildings, people who build buildings, like that's artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of even when people walk, I love observing people um, because everything tells a story. Mm -hmm. And that just makes me think that art is embedded in our everyday lives. But for some reason, art has now been on the bottom of the totem pole. And now we, you know, people assume that everything else comes first. And it's like, well, no, you're creating art every time you move. I mean, like, you know, I go to school, I've gone to school for four years and we learn how to breathe, learn how to move, learn how to, you know, stand, walk, things like that. And it's like, you can't tell me that these aren't, life is an art, you know? Uh, can I ask you, yeah. what can you do as an artist to help your community or anyone in the world see through that lens? Oh, the lens of? Of seeing art in all. Mm. You know, I've thrown around the question of, do I open a school? <laughs> yeah. You know, my, my grandma was in education for 40 years. My aunt has, I believe, her third master's in education. Mm -hmm. Like I said, my mom was a director for a school for 13 years as well. I don't know. I think it's really about having those conversations at young ages about, you know, how we view things. And I don't know if that starts with school or if that starts in the classroom. But at the same time, there's something that starts at home. Yeah. So something that I always say that I'll do is start to reform the community. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to, I'm not saying I'm getting to the point where I'm tired of relying on city officials and government officials, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, I, I think if we look at history, it's like, what is good has this done us? So, you know, not to say when I make my first million, but when I make my first million, it's, it's really about where does it get plugged into back into the community? Mm -hmm. Not all people of color in Chicago, but a good portion of us. We are kind of in neighborhoods that don't really feel like they belong to us. And I think it's due to the fact that, you know, the lives of people of color have never really been on the forefront for anyone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once again, it's like that conversation, who's going to feed our people when our people need to eat? I think it's like, it's all on us, if not anybody else, to, to do these things. I want to continue, but <laughs> <laughs> we have so much other things to do. That was a wrap, but no, literally, we continue this conversation.